Lord God, sometimes your word and your, your God story comes to us in ways that we can't quite fully fathom. And so today, as we stand on the verge of uh, this Advent season, this Christmas season, we wonder why on earth we would be holding up the story of Daniel and the lion's den and all of the, all of the, the details that go with that story. But Lord, keep our hearts and our minds now focused on Christ and his coming, and let us just see if we can find a place in this story that will draw us closer to you and that will open us up to this season of hope and expectation and strengthen us in faith, Lord, as this story has its way with us, with our hearts and with our wills. We pray in Jesus' name. Well, we're moving now into the season of Advent, as I just prayed. We're going to do some preparation for Christmas. Who's got the tree up already? Let's see. Couple. Okay. All right. We're moving. All right. I uh, talked to a friend of mine the other day. I said, you got the tree up? She said, I can only do one holiday at a time. Okay. So Thanksgiving weekend, I totally understand. But uh, we come across here at the beginning of Advent, one of the most well-known Bible stories of all time, right? The story of Daniel and the lion's den. And uh, uh, you know the story well. You probably heard it in Sunday school. It was probably retold to you in your home. Most of us know the shorthand version, right? That Daniel is thrown into the lion's den, that the angel of the Lord comes and shuts up the mouth of the lion so that he is not harmed or destroyed in any way. Uh, but few of us, I bet few of us have ever really taken a hard look at the details of this story. And I'll bet even fewer of us have actually ever taken this story seriously in our life of faith. Because when we read this story, most of us consider the story of Daniel to be a children's Sunday school fairy tale. Not that it didn't happen, but, but, but a story that's told to wide-eyed youngsters as they sit around Sunday school rooms uh, to teach them the awesomeness of God's power. But this story is so much more than that. Uh, but I want to I wanna just challenge you to go home and do a cursory Google image search and write in Daniel in the lion's den. You know what you'll find there? You'll find cartoon books. You'll find children's coloring pages. You'll find crafts and mazes. Help Daniel get past the sleeping lion. You'll find cupcake liners and popsicle sticks and pillows and masks. And I'm not against any of that. I love it when children read their Bibles and when we do crafts with children to help them have faith. But I just wonder... If anyone here today has ever taken this story seriously. I just wonder if any of us have ever let this story have its way with us. Because that's what the Bible is for, right? It's for the Word of God to have its way with us. So, uh, here it is, with no further ado, a classic three-point Lutheran sermon on Daniel in the lion's den. Point one. This story is a story of civil disobedience, isn't it? It's a story of civil disobedience. And it's a story of competing powers, not a children's fairy tale, but competing powers. We have God and Daniel, we have King Darius. And if you ever read the book of Daniel, you see that the first six chapters are devoted to this time that's called the Babylonian exile. When, when the people of Israel were defeated and the people were dispersed uh, into, into nations and into Babylon as well. And as the people were scattered into these places, they began to live their faith and ponder deep questions. Like, how can I live my faith when everything that I have has been torn from me? How, how can I live my faith when I live in a culture that's hostile to my faith? Daniel's in a place that is hostile to his belief system. How can I live as a, refu a refugee and an exile in a strange land? Remember, one of our most famous psalms in the Bible is based on this experience. You know the psalm? Psalm 137. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. For how could we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? You hear the poignant heart of that psalm comes right from this moment in history? How can we be people of faith in a culture that's hostile to our faith? And the practice of faith became an issue for Daniel, right? King Darius is tricked by his counselors into creating this 30-day 
a time period where no one will pray to anyone but him. But Daniel continued to pray, not only continued to pray, but went into his upper room and threw those windows open as if for all to see what he was doing. Daniel is a story of civil disobedience, of pushing back against the powers that be. And I just wonder, <clears throat> excuse me, if Daniel were alive in another time, how he would look and what he would be doing. You know what? I bet you could not take his life and his faith and create a mere coloring book <laughs> or a children's craft. I wonder if Daniel would have been found at another time with the revolutionaries in our own colonies crying out against taxation without representation or with George Washington at Valley Forge. Don't ever forget, our nation was created by a series of small civil disobedience, wasn't it? I wonder, I wonder if Daniel would have been found in South Africa fighting against apartheid or in Selma, Alabama marching with Dr. King or even today protesting the Dakota Pipeline. And I don't say those things to you because I'm aligned with a political theory or, or a political position, but I want you to see Daniel in the most bare and honest terms. Because this is a story of civil disobedience. This is a story of a man who faced a government that said, your faith is illegal. You can't pray to your God for the next 30 days. And it says that Daniel opened his windows to the world and he prayed. And throughout human history, there have been incursions on religious freedom. And not only in times past, even today, the theory is bantied around about whether or not our Muslim brothers and sisters, our Muslim neighbors, should be registered right here in America where we have religious freedom. So it would be good for us to think of this story as a story of civil disobedience and of religious freedom. And remember Daniel's courage as he stood up to an all-powerful government. See, Daniel makes us wonder, what is it like to live in a world that's hostile to faith? And, and, and how should we live in that environment? And how are we going to operate in that culture that is hostile to faith rather than comply with it? Because this story is not a children's fairy tale. It's a story of civil disobedience. Point two. The story of Daniel is a story about orientation. That is, it is a story about the direction of our lives. And Daniel probes at that question and says, how are we going to orient ourselves how are we going to, which direction are we going to point our lives? And if you might note in the story, it says that Daniel did not only go into his home, open his windows and pray, it says that he literally oriented himself toward Jerusalem. It says he physically turned his back on King Darius and those religious laws that he had put in place and he pointed himself toward God. I want you to pick that up in this story loud and clear. This is not popsicle sticks and cupcake wrappers. This is a question about where we have our, where we pray and where we orient our lives. And when a ruler of state says, only I will be worshipped. When a ruler of state says, I and I alone can fix this problem, Daniel knows what's up. He knows what's going on. And this king, who is supposedly all-powerful, who's been unwittingly tricked by his own counselors, Daniel knows, is no ultimate power. No ultimate power. And so he turns his back on Darius. And, we, and if we're going to take Daniel seriously, for the first time in our lives, take the story of Daniel seriously and let it speak to us, then we should be asking ourselves today, what is central to my life? What is most important to me? Where does my allegiance lie? What is worthy of my worship? What is worthy of my loyalty? And when we ask that question and we make that decision about the central things of our lives, then we make our stand as Daniel did. And my friends, that's not arts and crafts. And that's not Sunday school, Sunday school simplicity. That's important for us to say. It's important for us to think about. 
This is a story about the direction of your life in a hostile culture. And number three, Daniel is a story of witness, right? And not only Daniel, as he witnesses in his prayer and in his worship to God, but even King Darius himself becomes a witness, saying to Daniel as he comes to the den of the lions, Oh, Daniel, did the God who you loyally serve keep you safe? And and, and later, uh, the God of Daniel is the living God enduring forever. But that God sometimes stands in opposition to kings and governments. That God whom Daniel worshipped while kneeling and pointing toward Jerusalem, later sent his own son, himself a refugee, not to grasp power, not to grasp control, but to humbly serve and to die and to be raised from the dead. And as we enter the season of Advent and we move toward Christmas, I just wonder, doesn't it seem odd that the story we read is the story of Daniel in the lion's den? But let me suggest something. Maybe Advent is a season of civil disobedience. Maybe Advent is a season in which we resist every power that attempts to throw us off our game. Maybe this is a season when the culture tells us to buy more and more stuff that we can learn how to give more away. And in a a season when when the culture tries to tell us to do more for our own needs, we could think even longer and harder than ever about the needs of others. And maybe, like Daniel, we could quietly and joyfully resist King Darius in this culture that is so hostile to faith And instead focus on Jesus who says, I have life for you. I have a life that really is life. Maybe Advent is a good time to cut against the grain of this culture. That's my watch. And maybe Advent is a good time to consider the direction of our lives, our orientation, literally the direction of our life. If Daniel can turn his back on an all-powerful ruler of state to face God directly in worship and prayer, then maybe this holiday season could become for you and me a time to refocus, a time to reorient, and a time to redirect and to literally ask ourselves and even talk about it today on the way home from church with your children, your spouse, or whoever you came with, what's important to us? What what are our priorities? What is the direction of our lives? Where do we want to spend our money, our time, our passion, our energy? And if and if Daniel, if Advent can be that, then I give you Daniel as a great example for this season. And, And and maybe, maybe ultimate claims will be made, right? And wouldn't it be ironic, in a world where great claims are made, in the midst of a Christian holiday, that we would find it more difficult to pray? Wouldn't it be ironic that in in the midst of a Christian holiday, we would find it more difficult to devote ourselves to prayer? More difficult to to, to, to devote ourselves to the things of ultimate importance? Because we live in a culture that is hostile to faith. Now, I don't mean you can't say Merry Christmas to people at the store. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that Jesus makes an ultimate claim on our lives, and that ultimate claim goes unnoticed. Even in the season when we celebrate his birth, it goes unnoticed. And maybe, maybe Advent could be about witness as Daniel's story was. A time where ordinary people can live their faith and care for other souls and be generous and loving and not have any power in this world tell them that it's wrong and that they can't do these things. And if that's the case, if Advent could be about witness and the direction of our lives, then I, then I give you Daniel. <laughs> as a great story to kick off the season. You know, I was writing my sermon on Wednesday. I have the greatest, I've said you this before, I have the greatest seat in the house at Celebration. Right from my office, I see people come to our church all day long. And on Wednesday, 
All I saw was cars, Lutheran cars, pulling up in our parking lot. You know what they were doing? They are doing what Lutherans do, bringing food, bars, pies, because we were hosting uh, the community Thanksgiving service on Wednesday night. Car after car after car pulled up. And, and then more people pulled up, and they left with reeds because so many people bought reeds to support our youth on their mission trips this year. I see the reeds and the swags and everything going out the door. And then I looked again, and I saw this giant van being pushed full of food, all of it going to Place of Hope. Did you know that we served two meals at Place of Hope from Celebration last, last week? One is our regular Sunday, and we did again on Thursday. You brought that food, and you, you served that meal but I just wonder if any of those people realize that what they were doing was a tiny act of civil disobedience in a culture that is violent and, uh, and, and stands against faith. I wonder if those people realize that what they were doing was orienting themselves toward God by the service of the poor or living as a witness because that's what they were doing. That's what this season of preparation is about. And it's time for us to notice that. You know, there's an, old, there's an old children's song about Daniel. Um, I don't know if you remember singing this in Sunday school, but the words say, Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command, honor them the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. So what do you think? What will your Christmas civil disobedience be? And how are we going to push back against a culture that is hostile to faith? And how will you direct yourself during the month of December? How will you orient your life? And what witness will you give? Because the one who deserves your truest allegiance stood before the power of Pilate's throne and said, my kingdom is not of this world. And then he died and then he rose from the dead so that he could have the ultimate claim on your life. And you know what? A lot of kingdoms came and left before Jesus arrived. And a lot of them will come and go before he returns. But King Darius himself gave the greatest witness of all as he declared in this story, his kingdom, God's kingdom, will never be destroyed. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as you are able. We're going to